It's International Women's Day. Let's start by talking about Rosalind Franklin. Franklin was the lady genius who single-handedly discovered DNA. Her work was then maliciously stolen by two men named James Watson and Francis Crick, who took credit for all of her work and robbed her of the Nobel Prize. Hashtag smash the patriarchy, hashtag oppressed women of history. I mean, it really does sound fucking awful when you put it like that, and it would be awful if any of it were actually true. The actual progression of historical events is somewhat more complicated than the tired old man bad, woman good, patriarchal oppression narrative that we're fed by the pro-feminist mainstream. I'm going to condense a lot of history here, but to start with, let's just get this minor issue out of the way first. Franklin did not discover DNA. Neither did Watson and Crick. Towards the last third of the 19th century, Friedrich Miescher had discovered a microscopic substance which he called nucleon, and later eventually managed to isolate a pure sample of what we now call DNA. In 1878, Albrecht Kossel successfully isolated the five nucleobases that ultimately made up RNA and DNA. In 1889, Friedrich Miescher's pupil Richard Altman coined the term nucleic acid. Time progressed and so did the science. In 1919, biochemist Phobos Levina suggested that DNA consisted of a string of these nucleotide units linked together to form a chain along a sugar phosphate backbone. In 1927, Nikolai Koltsov proposed that traits would be inherited via a giant hereditary molecule made up of two mirror strands that would replicate in a semi-conservative fashion using each strand as a template. And in 1937, William Osterbury produced the first X-ray diffraction patterns showing that DNA had a regular structure. You'll note here that Rosalind Franklin was not even the first person to produce X-ray images of DNA, but I digress. By the time the King's College DNA research team, which included Franklin, Watson and Crick, was assembled, the issue was not the discovery of DNA or the component-based pairs that made it up, or even the understanding that it was the most likely candidate to explain the transference of heritable traits between organisms and their offspring. What they were working towards at that point was a fully fleshed out functional model of the giant hereditary molecule itself. Watson and Crick started working on their model together in late 1951, meaning that by early 1953, when fellow King's College researcher Maurice Wilkins committed the professional faux pas of privately showing Watson a high-quality X-ray diffraction image from Franklin's lab, infamously known as Photo 51, Watson and Crick already had a theoretical, albeit flawed, working model of DNA. To the extent that their work was based on her findings, they did not simply up and steal her shit. Photo 51 helped them to adjust the working model that they had already been developing for over a year and a half. And despite this professional faux pas on the part of Wilkins, as well as the less than amicable professional relationship between Watson and Franklin, their research and development did not happen behind Franklin's back. It was in fact Franklin herself who personally told Watson and Crick that based on her X-ray diffraction images, the sugar phosphate backbone of the nucleotide chain had to be on the outside of the helix, not the inside. All of this ultimately culminated in the Watson and Crick article, A Structure for Deoxyribose Nucleic Acid, published alongside five other papers from the King's College DNA research team, including Franklin's, in the April 1953 issue of the journal Nature. In that publication, Watson and Crick's article made direct references to Franklin's article, citing it as some of the experimental data that underpinned their theoretical model. Over the next several years, Watson and Crick continued to develop their DNA model further, ultimately transforming it into what we know today as the scientific field of molecular biology. The public turning point was Francis Crick's famous 1957 lecture laying out the central dogma of molecular biology, in which DNA creates RNA and RNA creates proteins. Final confirmation of the replication mechanism that was implied by the double helical structure followed in 1958 through the Messelson-Stahl experiment. Meanwhile, in that same year, Rosalind Franklin passed away due to cancer. 
finally considered a fully-fledged scientific theory backed by sufficient experimental research, Watson, Crick and Wilkins were ultimately awarded the 1962 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. The order of those last few events is a rather important piece in this story, at least for the way it's told by feminists. Assuming that Photo 51 even did represent enough of a contribution to the final scientific theory that Watson and Crick developed, a claim that I personally find dubious, Franklin still wasn't cheated out of a Nobel Prize. The rules for the Nobel Prize explicitly stipulates that it is only awarded to living persons, not given posthumously. It was undoubtedly Watson and Crick who spent a decade developing the theoretical model for DNA, as well as the whole new scientific field of molecular biology. To the extent that Franklin's X-ray diffraction photo helped their work, she was more than adequately credited. There is certainly no basis to claim that Franklin was the mastermind behind the theory of DNA, who had her work stolen as part of some patriarchal conspiracy. In fact, this is where we get to what I think is the most interesting and neglected little fact about the entire Rosalind Franklin mythos as told by the feminist mainstream. You see, Photo 51, the X-ray diffraction image at the heart of this entire scientific controversy, was actually taken by Franklin's very male PhD student, Raymond Gosling. Yes, you heard that correctly, Franklin didn't even take the fucking photo. The only thing she took was the credit as Raymond Gosling's PhD supervisor. Now, hyperbole aside, the student-supervisor relationship is no doubt a precarious one. Who is entitled to what share of the credit is a tricky question, and not one that I really intend to answer here. What I do find interesting, however, is how much the feminists love to carry on about female students like Jocelyn Bell Burnell having their work stolen by evil male supervisors, a claim that Bell Burnell herself has more or less denied. But it is rather telling that when you get to their all-time favourite accusation of patriarchal theft in science, the feminists are remarkably silent about the fact that it was actually Rosalind Franklin's male PhD student who took the famous and controversial Photo 51, not Franklin herself. All that being the case, one might then be forgiven for asking the question, why the fuck has DNA research and the subsequent Nobel Prize been turned into such a landmark gender issue? Why has it become such a commonly accepted mainstream feminist myth about the existence of a scientific boys club that oppresses female scientists? Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that everything at King's College was peachy. There was apparently a lot of tension between the various labs, in no small part due to the poor management and miscommunication of John Randall, who headed the department which all of these people worked under. But evidence of institutionalised misogyny? Look, looking at the facts, there is literally nothing about this situation that supports the feminist narrative of a female scientist being cheated out of a Nobel Prize by male co-workers because patriarchy. Franklin wasn't the first person to take X-ray diffraction images of DNA. She didn't actually take Photo 51 herself, and beyond providing some experimental data which helped support and refine the working model, it's arguable how much these X-ray diffraction photos directly contributed to the completed theories of DNA and molecular biology, which took Watson and Crick a decade of hard work to develop. Here is the ultimate and disappointing truth about the Rosalind Franklin mythos. If it wasn't for the controversy, nobody would even know Rosalind Franklin's name, because the controversy of credit itself is ultimately far more interesting than any of the scientific work she could actually be legitimately credited with. I think another great example of this romanticism, or dare I say revisionism of historical female achievement, is Ada Lovelace, a mathematical wunderkind who grew up to become a close associate of Charles Babbage. Lovelace is widely credited as being the world's first computer programmer, having published a paper which included an algorithm to compute Bernoulli numbers on Babbage's non-existent hypothetical mechanical computer called the Analytical Engine. 
There's quite a good three-part series that Computerphile did on the work of Babbage and Loveless, wherein David Brailsford suggests that Loveless really saw past the technological limitations of her era and recognised that with sufficiently complex algorithms, novel problems could be mechanically solved, even creative problems like the ability to generate music. It's all very inspiring. Don't get me wrong, I find her an interesting historical oddity as much as anyone else. However... My problem with all this romanticisation of Lovelace and her work is that the question really needs to be asked, what was her actual contribution to the field of computer science? In other words, how much of our modern computing technology is ultimately based on her ideas and her research? In much the same way that religious fanatics can look back and interpret vague passages from Revelations as being holy prophecy which predicted satellite television, it is very easy for us to look back with 2020 hindsight and interpret an otherwise obscure mathematician like Lovelace as being a computer genius a century ahead of her time. And whilst there may even be some modicum of truth underlying that assessment, the real-world question still remains, how do her quantifiable achievements actually stack up against someone like Alan Turing? Lovelace's work was entirely theoretical. To this day, there is still no working model of Babbage's analytical engine, meaning that her Bernoulli algorithm was never actually run and tested. To the extent that her ideas appear interesting and ahead of their time, it is all being interpreted in hindsight from the view of our 21st century internet-connected ivory towers. But in terms of real, practical application, her work was and remains to this very day fucking useless. Her work ultimately amounts to nothing more than the musings, albeit interesting musings, of a 19th century aristocrat whose lofty ideas never saw fruition and fell into complete obscurity for over a century, until eventually being rediscovered in recent years and shared around with some degree of hobby interest on our modern digital internet that Loveless and her work actually had no hand in creating. The pioneers of digital computing during the 1930s and 40s did their work completely unaware that Babbage and Lovelace had ever existed. The unfortunate truth is, if Lovelace had succumbed to consumption, polio or cholera during childhood, the modern world would not miss her contribution to the field of computer science one iota. Her work ultimately had zero impact on our world. And yet today, certain agenda-driven revisionists, blinded by a combination of feminism and 21st century hindsight, are trying their damnedest to credit her with far more than she actually deserves. Ada's Algorithm. How Lord Byron's daughter Ada Lovelace launched the digital age. Full disclosure, I have not read this book, but just based on the title alone, I suspect it is probably full of shit, given that Babbage's analytical engine was designed to perform decimal computations. In fact, apart from a few musings by Gottfried Leibniz on the subject, the idea of binary logic and computation had not even occurred to people by the early 19th century. Frankly, if anyone from that era could be credited with laying the groundwork for our modern information age, that person would undoubtedly be George Boole, whose mathematical ideas would eventually lead to the development of Boolean algebra, the logical backbone behind today's digital computation. His ideas on binary logic were comprehensively laid out in his book, The Laws of Thought, published in 1854 two years after Lovelace had already died, meaning that, far from launching the digital age, Lovelace more than likely remained ignorant of such concepts her entire life. Alan Turing, by comparison, devised the world's first mathematical model for a universal digital computer, the Turing machine. His simple instruction set for read, write, go-to and conditional statements, which manipulated an arbitrary amount of memory, laid the very foundational groundwork for all modern computer science, with all modern computers, even the latest greatest threadrippers, being quote-unquote Turing-complete. 
He designed and built the cryptographic bomb, a complicated electromechanical computer which allowed the English to decipher the Nazi Enigma code. He wrote papers and mathematical proofs about the practical limitations on computer programming such as the halting problem, as well as other papers on reaction diffusion systems which help explain the mechanics behind organic cell growth. He's even one of the founding fathers of artificial intelligence research, devising the imitation game commonly known today as the Turing test, wherein a blind observer interacts with a computer console and has to determine whether or not they are interacting with a computer program or another human being on another terminal. There is a lot of criticism to be levelled at the Turing test. For one thing, as a true test of intelligence, it could quite easily be cheated with a relatively simple program like ELISA, which utilised a phrase list and pattern matching. It was also fairly academic at the time that Turing devised it, as the computers of the day were nowhere near advanced enough to pass such a test. In fact, his initial idea for a Turing test appearing in his 1948 paper Intelligent Machinery actually proposed an experiment wherein several people played chess, but some of those players were secretly following an algorithmic rule set known as a paper machine. Nonetheless, unlike the theoretical work of Lovelace, which has amounted to absolutely fucking zilch over the last century, the Turing test is still used to this day as a practical yardstick to assess real-world functional systems like internet chatbots, which are becoming more and more common as first points of contact for customer service and technical support on internet websites like eBay and Amazon. A radical feminist I went to college with once told me rather matter-of-factly that it was called history because it was his story. Well, that's undoubtedly difficult logic to argue against, but seriously, is that really true? We refer to Alan Turing as the father of modern computing, whilst Lovelace and her work remains relatively obscure. Is it really all the result of a sexist conspiracy by the patriarchy to gaslight the historical achievements of women? Or is it simply the fact that in real practical terms, Ada Lovelace actually contributed sweet fuck all to our modern information age? I recently got a subscription to Audible and I was surprised, although perhaps I shouldn't have been, when I stumbled on their page for history books. Let me ask you this, when you think of fascinating figures in history, who do you think of? Galileo, Aristotle, Henry VIII, Muhammad Ali, Bertrand Russell, Albert Einstein, Nikola Tesla, Teddy Roosevelt, Christopher Columbus, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, JFK, Winston Churchill, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan. Or do you think of women and only women? Yeah. Forget Genghis Khan, the real fascinating figures of history were actually the Mongol queens. And what about the aforementioned Alan Turing, father of modern computing? Well, perhaps he'll get a passing mention in The Bletchley Girls. the, The irony is not lost on me that these are not even historical figures, but rather historical groups. Under a section titled Fascinating Figures in History, they couldn't even highlight individual females interesting enough to justify their own eponymous books. History is apparently no longer about history, it's about appeasing the collective inferiority complex of women. And as it turns out, they have every reason to feel inferior. History is in fact his story, but not for the reasons of patriarchal gaslighting that my feminist classmate believed. History real history, ultimately tells the long, protracted saga of male achievement against adversity, taking our species on a perilous 10,000-year voyage all the way from mud huts to the surface of the moon. This real history is then appended by a long list of postmodernist footnotes wherein women attempt to ride the coattails of men, expecting the same praise and adoration for what has already been achieved, as if these Johnny-come-lately females were somehow equal contributors to our species' present success. It reminds me of that famous quote by Mark Twain. In the beginning of a change, the patriot is a scarce man, and brave and hated and scorned. When his cause succeeds, the timid join him, for then it costs nothing to be a patriot. 
On the 12th of April 1961, Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin was blasted through the atmosphere by rockets, becoming the first person to break Earth's gravity and reach space, making a complete orbital revolution of the planet before returning safely to the surface of the Earth. Does anyone really give a single fuck that two years later, Valentina Tereshkova basically just did the exact same thing? First person into space, parentheses, with a vagina. Sorry, but I'm not really impressed. Sir Edmund Hillary, first person to officially reach the summit of Mount Everest on the 29th of May, 1953. Two decades later, Junko Tobai became the first woman to reach the summit. Ferdinand Magellan, first person to circumnavigate the globe from 1519 to 1522. It took two fucking centuries for Jeannie Barrett to become the first woman to circumnavigate the globe, and that is a fairly generous statement given that she was stowed away as the botanist's assistant. She didn't do any actual navigation herself. You know, I'm not even an aviation nerd, but off the top of my head, I can name the Wright brothers, Igor Sikorsky, Chuck Yeager, and Howard Hughes. All of the men who in some way changed the face of aviation. The only famous female aviator who comes to my mind is Amelia Earhart, a woman whose great claim to fame is that she crashed and burned somewhere over the Pacific in 1937, attempting and spectacularly failing to circumnavigate the globe by air, a feat which the men of the United States Army Air Service had already achieved more than a decade earlier in 1924. 16th of July, 1969. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The famous words of Neil Armstrong as he stepped from Apollo 11's Eagle landing module onto the surface of an extraterrestrial world. To this day, no woman has stepped foot on the moon ever. The typical feminist excuse is that women were institutionally prevented from competing against men in these arenas of achievement. Were they? Were women prevented from doing these things, or were they simply incapable of doing them from the outset? Discrimination does seem to serve as a very effective cover story to distract from innate inability. The insanely high mental and physical entry requirements of astronaut programs aside, to my knowledge, there was no sign at the base of Mount Everest that read, no girls allowed. So why then did a man beat women to the summit by over two decades? The flimsy excuse of discrimination seems to hold even less water when we move away from dangerous physical activities like space travel, circumnavigation and mountaineering to more academic pursuits. The discrimination hypothesis wouldn't, for instance, explain how in 1911, before women even had the vote, Marie Curie was able to win the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, making her not just the first woman but the first person in history to win two Nobel Prizes, and to this day she remains one of only two people in history to have ever received the Nobel Prize for two completely separate fields of science, her first being the 1903 Nobel Prize for Physics. It appears to me that there has never really been an institutional barrier for women to excel in scientific fields. Science doesn't give a shit about the genitals of the researcher, it cares about testable, repeatable results. If a woman could do the research, she would be appropriately rewarded for her achievements, as was Marie Curie over a century ago. Why then are there so few notable female scientists, to the point that feminists feel the need to engage in historical revisionism, elevating women like Ada Lovelace and Rosalind Franklin far beyond their actual achievements? I have even heard of some feminists pushing this laughable accusation that Einstein plagiarised the theory of relativity from his wife. Even if you were to pretend that Marie Curie never existed and continue to push the patriarchy myth that women were historically prevented from doing science, the fact remains that women are certainly not prevented from entering science today. 
There is in fact a two to one female hiring bias in STEM, as well as a plethora of female oriented affirmative action, quotas and scholarship programs. Not to mention that Western high school systems have been continuously tweaked over the last century to make it appear that girls are academically outperforming boys. This has ultimately resulted in most Western universities having a predominantly female student body. It's around 65% here in Australia. That is two thirds female. And yet these women dominating our Western university systems are not going into difficult STEM fields. The supposed institutional barriers that once existed are all officially gone now, but women as a demographic are still spectacularly underperforming. As a demographic, they are still not contributing in a meaningful way that helps the future success of our species. According to a study by the World Intellectual Property Organization, only 29% of patents internationally filed have at least one female inventor. Focusing on the US, that number is only about two thirds the international average with less than 20% of patents having at least one female inventor. Now, you'll notice this specific wording in both of these cases, quote unquote, having at least one female inventor. In other words, these numbers reflect all patents in which a female was peripherally involved in some team capacity. This report from the Institute of Women's Policy Research shows that if we only look at patents filed where the primary inventor and patent holder is female, that number drops to only 7.7%. A commenter on a previous video suggested that we couldn't entirely discount the effect of historical legacy. He argued that gender disparities haven't completely caught up yet because it's really only been the last 30 years that women have been given a fair chance. A fact that I am sure Marie Curie and her two Nobel Prizes would disagree with. But nonetheless, this argument is fairly unconvincing on its own when you consider the relative youth of some of these emerging STEM fields. I mean, just look at this article on Business Insider tallying the number of female systems engineers at the big tech companies. The statistics themselves are fucking pathetic, but in the context of this historical legacy argument, consider the fact that most of these companies haven't even existed for 30 years. This gaping gender discrepancy in modern tech jobs is not explained by historical prejudice in the tech industry because frankly, the tech industry as it were didn't go back much past the early 80s. It is a completely new market. 30 years ago, only 20% of US households had a home computer. 20 years ago, only 10% of those households had an internet connection. People my age, the men and women of our current working generation started off well and truly into the latter decades of second wave feminism on exactly equal footing in terms of information technology access. And yet, according to the most recent Stack Exchange community survey, in 2017, only 7.2% of professional software developers and 8.3% of software students were female. This disparity is not because of discrimination. Like I said, Marie Curie managed to get her two Nobel Prizes over a century ago. And since that time, every conceivable barrier, real or imagined, has been removed. And yet women still only account for 7.7% of primary patent holders and 7.2% of professional software developers. These are not impressive statistics, especially when you consider all the affirmative action now stacked in women's favour. The world of politics does not look much better. In virtually every modern democratic egalitarian country, from every corner of the globe, we are lucky if we see women enter politics at a rate much higher than 30%. Even the Scandinavian countries, which are so backbreakingly gynocentric, their cities literally ground to a halt last winter due to an ill-fated feminist snowplowing program, their national governments are still only topping out at around 40% female. Whilst these raw political numbers are interesting in their own right, things become even more interesting when we start looking at the ways in which these female politicians actually govern. We often hear the patronising claim that if women ran the world, there'd be no more war. 
Okay, well, why don't you go and tell that to Margaret Thatcher, who charged headfirst into the Falklands? And I know, it was a British colony, Argentina drew first blood. The point is that Lady Prime Minister didn't exactly sit around waiting to come up with a more peaceable solution. In fact, in complete opposition to the mainstream conventional wisdom that men are warmongers whilst women are peacemakers, this study published by the National Bureau of Economic Research found that European queens over the centuries had been 27% more likely to wage war than their male counterparts. Quote, A large scholarship claims that states led by women are less conflictual than states led by men. We surmount this challenge by exploiting features of hereditary succession in European polities over the 15th to 20th centuries. We found that queenly reigns participated in more interstate conflicts without experiencing more internal conflicts. Moreover, the tendency of queens to participate as conflict aggressors varied based on marital status. These results are consistent with an account in which queens relied on their spouse to manage state affairs, enabling them to pursue more aggressive war policies. We found that polities ruled by queens were 27% more likely to participate in interstate conflicts compared to polities ruled by kings. End quote. Despite the prevailing pro-female myth, women being in charge does not lead to peace. To the contrary, our biased assumptions that women are naturally peaceful caregivers seems to be clouding our ability to objectively assess these females and their propensity as leaders towards interstate conflict. Ultimately, we are letting our gynocentric reproductive biases overshadow some rather glaring red flags when it comes to the political leadership of women. I can't think of a better example of this than Indira Gandhi, the woman who suspended the largest democracy in the world and ruled over India for two years by decree. The emergency, as it was quaintly referred to, apparently involved imprisoning her political opponents, censoring the press, and a mass program of forced sterilisation perpetrated against her own people. The violent conflict she initiated which divided Pakistan still has international ramifications to this day. I mean, this lady was such a vile, nasty, evil, despotic piece of shit, she ended up being assassinated by her own bodyguards. But wouldn't you believe it, the good old BBC thought that her impressive list of human rights violations should earn her the title Greatest Woman of the Past Thousand Years. Are you fucking kidding me? Okay, I I don't expect a female Winston Churchill or a female Ben Chifley or a female Teddy Roosevelt because, you know, they just don't exist. But if we are going to nominate a woman of the millennium, is the female equivalent of Hitler really the best that the BBC can come up with? Even Margaret Thatcher... While some conservatives lionise her as the Iron Lady, it doesn't bode well when half of the country celebrates your death by lighting bonfires and singing Ding Dong the Witch is Dead. I mean, Churchill by comparison was not a particularly popular Prime Minister outside of the war years, but he was well respected by the British people. If we turn our attention to the more pedestrian female leaders of recent history like Angela Merkel and Theresa May, things don't really get any better. I mean, sure, there are some male leaders who are worse. Uh, At least Merkel and May aren't total fucking pussies who break down into tears every five minutes like two-time Mangina of the Year recipient Justin Trudeau. But, you know, the best you could really say about them is they're kind of meh. Angela Merkel's unfettered immigration policy has pretty well fucked Germany for years to come, and Theresa May looks like she's going to go down in history as the Prime Minister who failed to follow through on the Brexit referendum. Even our own Julia Gillard basically got into the top spot by stabbing sitting Prime Minister Kevin Rudd in the back. During her tenure, she achieved nothing of note, save for a few public tantrums about supposed misogyny, and then left the office the exact same way she entered it, with a knife stuck in her own back. I think Hillary Clinton's spectacularly awful 2016 presidential campaign is best summed up by the words of Jonathan Pye, who compared her with her megalomaniacal Twitter-obsessed opponent Donald Trump by asking the rather blunt question, How shit do you have to be to lose to that? 
I think it would be very easy to transition from the topic of failed female politicians to the recent string of failed female CEOs, incompetent women elevated far beyond their abilities through tokenism and nepotism, who systematically drove otherwise successful businesses into the fucking dirt. Yeah, Marissa Mayer and her complete destruction of Yahoo. Ellen Powell, disapprovingly referred to by her own Reddit user base as Chairman Powell, a a corporate position that she somehow wrangled after trying to fuck over her previous employer with a frivolous discrimination suit. Susan Wojcicki? Let's not even open that can of worms. However, whilst the topic of female watershed failures in the history of science, politics and big business is interesting, it does make me wonder, what are the average everyday women doing? How much are they contributing to the society that they benefit from? We are living in a post-industrial world where pure physical strength is no longer a limiting factor to career success. As the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt keeps telling me, women can do anything now. Well, they can do anything, but they're not, are they? I mean, yeah, it's true. You don't need to be a classic strongman to operate the levers of a bulldozer or use a cordless power drill. But despite this, women as a demographic have not gone into the business of building skyscrapers. Most modern work health and safety standards avoid giving strict numbers these days because everyone is a special and unique snowflake, blah, blah, blah. But nonetheless, they do often give some rough guidelines. This page on manual handling that I found from the University of Sydney stipulates that anything over 16 kilograms requires mechanical lifting aids or a team of people to safely lift. To put that into perspective, if stay-at-home mummy can muster the strength to lift her four-year-old child up and put them into a car booster seat, then there is literally nothing that she shouldn't be able to do on a job site if she is correctly following workplace safety legislation. And yet, when I walk past a construction site, virtually every person I see dressed in high-vis and donning a hard hat is male. In fact, if you're to believe this headline from The Guardian, construction workers are 99% male. The Australian government occasionally boasts about the progress we've made towards gender equality, stating that women now make up 15% of the mining industry, with a goal of 25% by 2020. That number sounds like a fairly paltry contribution to begin with, but it gets even worse when we actually find a categorical breakdown of the mining workforce, something which the Queensland government seems to have gone some lengths to hide. We find that the majority of these so-called mining industry women are in middle management positions. The government flaunts them as women in mining, but frankly they may as well be call centre workers in any other industry who just sit at a desk all day in a comfortable, safe, air-conditioned office. When it comes to the actual miners and machinery operators, you know, the actual women in mining, it turns out women only make up between 2.8 and 5.6% of those jobs. In the 1860s, Joseph Basil Ligeti designed and built the London sewage system, effectively ridding the city of both its bad smell and its consistent problem of cholera outbreaks. But according to this Daily Mail article, it was only as recently as 2013 that the UK saw its first two females willing to get their hands dirty as sewer workers. Women make up only 6% of train drivers, 6% of bus drivers, and 5.1% of truck drivers. In a 2012 report by the United States Department of Agriculture, we see that whilst women made up 30%, which is less than a third of farmers nationwide, only 14% of farms were being run by a principal female operator. They also make up less than 30% of workers in the manufacturing industry. According to this report by the New South Wales Department of Family and Community Services, quote, Fewer than 2% of construction, automotive and electrical tradespeople in Australia today are women. There were just 676 female carpenters, 931 female motor mechanics, 638 female plumbers and 1,432 female electricians nationwide in 2011, within a total technicians and trade workforce of nearly 1.43 million people, just over 14% of the workforce. 
In the largest single trade occupation in Australia, that of electrician, women were just 1.3% of the total, end quote. In recent videos, I have been talking a lot about the ways in which men are biologically superior to women. The fact is, however, that the criteria by which superiority is judged is somewhat subjective. For instance, if that criteria is athletic strength or problem-solving intelligence, men are clearly the superior gender. On the other hand, women actually have a superior sense of taste. They are more likely to be super tasters, physiologically possessing more taste buds on average than men. You might assume that this would give women an edge in the culinary arts, and that assumption would certainly align with our conventional wisdom that cooking is a domain of the feminine. Surely this must be a female-dominated profession. If you watch television game shows like Hell's Kitchen, which pits equal-sized teams of men and women against each other, you might even be forgiven for thinking that the numbers are close to 50-50. The reality, however, is that females actually account for less than 20% of professional chefs. If we narrow down our focus from all chefs to just the accomplished or outstanding chefs, that already meagre number shrinks significantly, with female chefs accounting for less than a percent of awarded Michelin stars. In the 2012 guide, there were roughly 2,500 restaurants that were awarded stars by Michelin. Of those, only 10 of them had a female head chef. Narrowing our focus of excellence down even further, in the century-long history of the Michelin Food Guide, only nine women have ever achieved the highest honour of three Michelin stars, a truly pathetic underachievement that Michelin themselves thought necessary to flaunt last International Women's Day. Whether it's an issue of raw talent, true grit, or a mixture of both, women just don't seem to have what it takes. To the extent that a proportion of women do choose to pursue a career in fast-paced, high-stress professional kitchens, fewer still are actually prepared or capable of putting in the additional hard work required to excel within that professional environment. It was men who built your house and every other building that you see around you. It's men who mine the coal that keep your electric lights on. Men manufacture your household goods. Men fix your car when it breaks down. Men keep the sewage from backing up. Men keep the trains running on time. Men run and work the farms which grow your food. And men cook your meals at restaurants. And keep in mind that these are just the tradesmen and technicians who actually made it happen. It was also male architects and male engineers who had the vision to design all of these buildings, cars, civil works and farming equipment in the first place. Civilization is a male endeavour. I suspect that if we were actually able to calculate an average female contribution, including not just their raw representative numbers, but also their hours worked, industry experience and specific areas of specialty, the real world input that these women have made towards building and maintaining our civilization, even in the current year, would likely be well below 10%. But what about an industry such as nursing? Unlike our commonly held misconceptions of cooking, we know for a fact that nursing is overwhelmingly female dominated, to the tune of 90%. Well, would you believe me if I told you that we see the exact same trend we do with Michelin stars? Women may dominate nursing in raw numbers, but it is still the men who dominate in terms of excellence and achievement. 90% of registered nurses are female, but when it comes time to specialise in a specific field of expertise, that gender gap narrows significantly. This page, which ranks five of the highest paying nurse specialties, shows that nurse anaesthetist was the highest paying specialty by a fairly wide margin. It also states that the gender divide in this particular specialty basically reaches parity with male nurses slightly ahead at 51%. Yeah. Who'd have guessed? Male nurses put in the hard work required to specialise in difficult, higher paying fields. Colour me surprised that as a result, many of the articles that Google returned while I was trying to search for information on gender breakdowns of specialty were salty articles bitching about the fact that women dominate the nursing field, yet men make more. Male nurses earn more than female nurses. At least a few had the common decency to explain that based on the actual data, it was a result of personal specialisation choices rather than systemic sexism. 
But, you know, I'm sure those articles are just part of the grand patriarchal cover-up to gaslight female nurses. One study on NCBI PubMed found that whilst 90% of registered nurses are female, 30% of first authors writing nursing literature were male. That is a pretty fucking significant difference. Going by their proportional representation in the industry of 10%, male nurses are basically publishing papers at a rate three times higher than their average female counterparts. Even in an industry overwhelmingly dominated by women, when it actually comes time to make an impact on that field, whether that is through writing white papers to be published in nursing journals or undertaking additional training to get into difficult specialties like anaesthetics, it is still overwhelmingly men who put in the additional hard work required. The researchers predictably chalk this huge discrepancy in published literature up to gender bias. But even their own feeble definition of bias basically amounts to female nurses personally prioritising social and family responsibilities over their careers, rather than anything that could be remotely described as institutional sexist discrimination. <laughs> Yeah, right. Social responsibilities. In other words, she wants to go out boozing with her friends instead of putting the extra hours into career development that her male co-workers do. And somehow, that personal choice apparently constitutes bias against her. I recently read the book Do No Harm by Henry Marsh, wherein he recounts one anecdote of a female anaesthetist who almost railroaded an operation for an elderly woman who'd already had her surgery delayed once that week already. She was the on-call anaesthetist, and when Marsh finally found her lounging around in the staff room drinking coffee and gossiping, she flat out refused to start an operation at four in the afternoon as planned, claiming that she didn't have childcare that night. In Marsha's own words, quote, For a few moments, I was struck dumb. I thought how until a few years ago, a problem like this would never have arisen. I always try to finish the list at a reasonable time, but in the past, everyone accepted that sometimes the list would have to run late. In the pre-modern NHS, consultants never counted their hours. You just went on working until the work was done, end quote. There is a reason why doctors are paid shitloads of money and are expected to work long hours. The list he refers to is the list of life-saving neurosurgical operations that he had to perform that day. You just went on working until the work was done because the alternative, you know, getting lazy and knocking off early, effectively meant killing people. I mean, that is truly terrifying to me. We have moved well beyond the hypotheticals of gender pay scales and aggregate difference in nursing specialisation here. We are now in the tangible world of specific life or death medical decisions. And apparently in that world, these bitches will literally put your life at risk without a second's thought just so they can knock off a little earlier to go home and play with their stupid kids. In my own humble opinion, if that's really where this lady's priorities lie, then she has clearly chosen the wrong profession. She is not suitable for the job of surgical anaesthetist. But I digress. Despite his own internal desire to yell at the woman, bugger childcare, you'll never work with me again, Marsh never goes so far as to explicitly blame this life-endangering workplace complacency on women increasingly entering the medical field. But there does seem to be ample evidence to suggest that this is the root cause of the problem. The physician who authored this article published in the Daily Mail laments the future of the NHS given that 2017 marks the first year that female doctors have outnumbered male doctors in the UK. From 2007 to 2012, the number of female doctors under the age of 30 has increased by 18%, whilst the number of males decreased by 1%. Whilst he purports to be a feminist, he notes that these numbers are somewhat troubling given that most female doctors end up working part-time, usually in general practice, and then retire early. Such a huge demographic increase in female physicians under the age of 30 now could mean a massive deficit in public health services later on. 
To give you an idea about the true scope of the problem that this guy is worried about, according to the numbers, 63%, almost two thirds of female doctors in the NHS work less than full time versus only 8% of male doctors. When broken down by sector, 19% of men versus 83% of women in general practice were working part time. And in hospital specialties, whilst only 3% of men were working part time, at 46%, almost half of all female hospital doctors were working part time. In fact, not only were women working significantly fewer hours, but other studies have also shown that per hour worked, the male doctors were also working significantly harder than their female counterparts. Quote, including only consultants on full-time or maximum part-time contracts, men have significantly higher activity rates than women, after accounting for age, specialty and hospital trust. Now, this problem of women not working their fair share of hours certainly isn't limited to the field of healthcare. We never seem to hear the end of complaints about the 77 cents on the dollar gender pay gap. And yet most of the available statistics show that women in the West only work around 85% of the weekly hours that their male counterparts work. This means that without even looking into the specifics of job selection like the rates of male nurse anaesthetists or female minors, a whole two thirds of the so-called gender pay gap is simply explained by women working less hours on average than men. When women complain about pay equality, what they are really saying is that they want to be paid the same 40 hour wage that men get for doing only 35 hours of work. And it doesn't stop there. This gender hours worked per week gap gets substantially wider depending on the conditions of the family home. I stumbled upon this little article some time ago, which contains some very interesting statistics on the hours of single breadwinner households. Breadwinners is in scare quotes, and we'll get to the reason for that momentarily. Quote, The research found that stay-at-home father arrangements made up 4% or 75,000 of the two-parent heterosexual families in Australia, while stay-at-home mothers accounted for 31%. Stay-at-home fathers and working mothers spent 19 and 21 hours a week on childcare respectively. These fathers did 28 hours of housework and working mothers did 23. Australian Institute of Family Studies Senior Research Fellow Dr Jennifer Baxter said the fact that breadwinning mothers worked less than their male counterparts, an average of 35 and 51 hours a week respectively, could help explain it, end quote. Now, to put that into perspective, under Australian workplace law, full-time employment is considered to start at about 38 hours a week. Yeah, these so-called breadwinning mothers aren't even averaging full-time gainful employment compared to their male counterparts who are averaging, not reaching a maximum peak, but averaging 51 hours a week. That is eight and a half hours a day, six days a week average. Care to guess the title of this article? Stay-at-home fathers do less childcare than working mothers' research shows. In an article which covers the fact that breadwinning fathers are spending almost 50% more time per week working to support their families compared with their female counterparts, the focus of the article is apparently the great humanitarian injustice that these so-called breadwinning mothers are spending a whole two extra hours a week playing with the baby. Actually, since the overarching theme of this video is women's overall contribution to society, let's just do some quick dirty napkin maths on the numbers in this article and compare the collective contributions of those single breadwinner family groups. If 75,000 families have stay-at-home fathers and that is 4% of the total, then 31% would be 581,250 families with a stay-at-home mother. 75,000 stay-at-home fathers multiplied by the 35 hours a week that breadwinning mothers work and 581,250 stay-at-home mothers multiplied by the 51 hours a week that breadwinning fathers work. Across this group, men are collectively working 29,643,750 hours a week. Comparatively, women are only working 2,625,000 hours a week. 
So across Australia's total 656,250 single breadwinner families, men are working over 11 times the number of hours per week that women work. 11 times. I mean, that is just fucking mind-blowing. You see all these articles complaining about young men's apparent failure to launch in modern society, but holy fuck, how does that even factor in with a gender discrepancy like this? With most statistical comparisons between the genders, you expect differences of 10 or 20%, maybe 50% tops, but man, 11-fold across single breadwinner families. That, that is a whole order of magnitude. Even, even I'm shocked at that number. Forget failure to launch. This is like a collective failure on the part of women. So fucking lazy, they wouldn't even turn on the television and watch the launch from the comfort of their couch. <laughs> International Women's Day, people. Give those ladies a clap. Now, whilst the callous, lazy entitlement of women in the workforce is an interesting topic, I think an equally interesting topic is the area of artistic expression. You see, thanks to government legislation, I am more or less forced by mandate to work alongside women and hold my tongue. One must keep up the collective delusion that the empress wears clothes. The very suggestion that workplace gender discrepancies are the result of anything other than institutional sexist discrimination could very well get you fired, a la James Damore. But no amount of government legislation or corporate diversity quotas are ever going to force men in the privacy of their own homes to voluntarily turn on Netflix and watch Amy Schumer complain for an hour about the barnyard animal smells that emanate from her crusty, unused vagina. You see, the field of science demands measurable, quantifiable results. And because of this, we have real numbers to work with. For every one Marie Curie that exists, there are 10 Isaac Newtons, Albert Einsteins, Niels Bohr, Maxwell Planck, Nikola Tesla, Charles Darwin, Aristarchus, Archimedes, Leonardo da Vinci, Johannes Kepler, Galileo Galilei, Robert Koch, Alan Turing, Richard Feynman, Richard Dawkins, Stephen Hawking, Carl Sagan, Edward Teller, Alfred Nobel, Alfred Russell Wallace, Alfred Wegener, Alfred Binet, Alfred Kinsey. I mean, fuck, the sheer number of accomplished Alfreds in the field of science would probably overshadow the total number of accomplished women, period. And the same goes for workplace accomplishments and earnings. We have quantifiable statistics tallying gender differences in job preferences, hours worked, sick days, on-the-job deaths, and so on. Stupid government equality legislation notwithstanding, we can actually calculate in real, quantifiable terms exactly how useless and lazy women are as a workplace demographic. But in this sense, the arts are a different beast entirely. After all, how do you go about putting a quantifiable value on something like comedy? Exactly what is it about Amy Schumer's disgusting, unwashed stinkhole that just renders her comedy routine completely unfunny? Well, I would say the problem is fairly obvious. Consider this comedy skit by Schumer titled Julia Lewis-Dreyfus's Last Fuckable Day. I I love all of you. I can't... (laughs) I can't believe you're here. I, you're like literally my heroes. God, you look familiar. Are you that girl from the television who talks about her pussy all the time? Yes! That is, yes! Thank you! Yeah, in her own comedy routine, Schumer literally has herself introduced by the other female comedians as, quote, that girl from the TV who talks about her pussy all the time. And yet she is so incapable of self-reflecting on this accidental observation that she actually thinks it was the fault of alt-right trolls that her Netflix special got bad reviews. Like, holy fuck. You don't really need to be a genius to figure out the underlying problem here. If Bill Hicks or George Carlin or Eddie Murphy or Bill Burr or Louis C.K. only ever made juvenile, vulgar jokes about how bad their dick cheese smells, do you really think they would have gained mainstream popularity? Men are essentially polymaths and their comedy routines reflect this. Their jokes tend to satirically explore the darker and more irrational aspects of human nature and human institutions. Jokes about politics, jokes about religion, jokes about relationships. Jokes that give you a different perspective and make you think about old things in a new light. Successful male comedians do not rely on juvenile vulgar dick jokes to carry their entire stage show. 
Women, however, are chronic narcissists, and this is reflected in their comedy routines. Topics explored by female comedians almost invariably come down to me and my vagina, me and my period, or me and my kids, usually with some punchline that resembles the sentiment, look at how oppressed I am. I mean, even when a female comedy starts out with an interesting enough premise like the aforementioned unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, as soon as the writers run out of ideas, it just deteriorates into the same old soapbox lecturing about how women can do anything and men are evil monsters who just want to control us, except for my gay best friend, of course. There are two fundamental problems with this female comedy style when it comes to holding an audience. The first and most obvious problem is that the male half of the audience really don't care to hear all the gory in-depth details about your smelly vagina or hear about how your poor life choices and personal insecurities are ultimately their fault because patriarchy. Congratulations, you have instantly lost half your audience. The second problem is that like the female comedians themselves, the female half of the audience are all a bunch of self-involved narcissists too. They ultimately want to talk at great length about their own smelly vaginas, but they don't necessarily want to hear all about yours for an hour. The fact is that when it comes to any kind of artistic or philosophical reflection, women really don't care about external topics. They only care about themselves. In any given conversational setting, other people's opinions are basically just annoying interruptions that hamper her ability to narcissistically ramble about herself. I mean... This is the fundamental reason why the term mansplaining even exists. Ultimately, mansplaining is not a problem of men factually correcting women, but about men taking time away from women to praise themselves. Case in point, the term mansplaining itself is based on an essay by Rebecca Solnit titled Men Explain Things to Me, wherein she recounts an anecdote of a dinner party that she attended. At the dinner party, the male host apparently kept interrupting her, talking at great length about a recently released book on moving picture pioneer Edward Maybridge. The great irony presented in the essay is that the male host didn't realise Solnit herself was the author of that very book. He was trying to mansplain her own book back to her without even realising it. Now, first of all, I don't fucking believe her story for a second, okay? Just know, there is no fucking way that she was invited to an intimate dinner party at a private chateau in Aspen, and the host who invited her there didn't realise that the recently published book he kept referring to was actually written by the lady sitting across from him. That's fucking bullshit. I don't buy it, it didn't happen, Rebecca Solnit is a bald-faced fucking liar who made the whole thing up. But even pretending for a second that her bullshit tale of dinner party woes is true, what exactly was her grievance with that situation? I mean, really think about it for a second. What she really seems pissed off about is that the guy was happily discussing the ideas her book was about, rather than simply lauding her with praise and adoration for publishing a book. Rebecca Solnit's grievance, which led to the very term mansplaining, was ultimately that her published ideas were the centre of attention, rather than herself being the centre of attention. The term mansplaining is ultimately not about the validity of what is being said, but rather a cold, unbridled declaration of female narcissism. And this chronic narcissism invades virtually every artistic endeavour that women have ever made. Male art is an expressive examination of the world around us, an often biased but always entertaining view of historical events like Delacroix's depiction of liberty leading the people or the Spanish Civil War depicted in Picasso's Guernica. Unlike women and their necessity for lived experience, it really doesn't matter that I am an atheist, I can still appreciate Michelangelo's creation of Adam. As an individual, Vincent van Gogh was crazy enough to cut off his own ear in the hopes that it would stop the schizophrenic voices in his head, but regardless, as an artwork, Starry Night still stands on its own merit. The male artist is always fairly separate to the subject matter that he explores in the world around him. He tends to be an observer. By comparison, female art is all about the self. Compare those seminal works of men to the works of Frida Kahlo, undoubtedly the most famous and celebrated female artist in history. I will admit that she is technically a competent painter, but her subject matter leaves something to be desired. It is narcissism. 
Plain and simple, everything she ever painted was a self-portrait and many of those self-portraits centre on the themes of childbirth and miscarriage. The entire artistic body of work by Frida Kahlo could best be summed up with the statement, woe is me and my vagina. This is the big difference. Female artists do not separate themselves from their art. Incapable of escaping the black hole of their own narcissism, more often than not, the female artist acts as her own subject matter. It is all about me, me, me. As new female artists rose to stardom through the 20th century in tandem with the political women's movement, things deteriorated even further into the pathetic feminist sloganeering of Barbara Kruger and Jenny Holzer, which I would argue have more in common with Orwellian political propaganda than anything that could be described as fine arts. And now, in the early 21st century, even this pop art propaganda has given way to disgusting, unwashed third wave feminists like Lani Beloso free bleeding onto canvases or Milo Miore who lets strangers finger bang her in public under the guise of performance art. Apparently even the notorious false rape accuser Emma Mattress Girl Solkowitz is now considered a successful feminist performance artist. The artisan works of women speak for themselves. Would you like a hand-knitted pussy hat? How about feminist bread baked using a vaginal yeast infection? Perhaps I could interest you in some period blood pancakes to go with that. This is female art. This is how women make a statement. This is how women express themselves. It is always about them and their vaginas. I don't really want to drag this out much longer, but on a final note, I think it's worth pointing out that this chronic female narcissism extends to the literary arts and philosophy as well. All of the great philosophers have been male. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Kant, Hume, Descartes, Voltaire, Nietzsche, Peter Singer, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, John Stuart Mill, John Rawls, you know, all of the Johns. Like Marie Curie and her Nobel Prizes, there has never really been a barrier to entry for women in philosophy. I mean, women like Jane Austen and Emily Bronte have always been able to publish their books. All women ever had to do was come up with some interesting philosophical ideas and then put pen to paper. But they didn't. Women as a demographic have contributed virtually nothing of value to the intellectual body of thought that we have accumulated about the nature of existence, morality and human consciousness. I mean, just consider the philosophical power couple of Jean-Paul Sartre and his wife Simone de Beauvoir. Sartre's work explored the existentialist nature of existence and the terrifying reality of loneliness that even in the presence of others, two people of separate mind can never truly know one another. Woe is the lonely nature of conscious existence. Simone de Beauvoir, on the other hand, spent her time complaining that women were supposedly relegated to being the second sex. Woe is me and my vagina. I get a lot of comments left on my channel, particularly on videos like this one, claiming that I just hate women, or that I'm just sad because I don't know how to interact with women, or that I'm just angry because some women in the past must have hurt me. I don't expect any of those white knighting simps will have made it this far into a video this long. They would have already thrown their little temper tantrum in the comment section and stormed off home. So this explanation isn't really for their benefit, but the fact is I get along with women just fine. You know, for the most part, my real life relationships with women are much the same as my relationships with men. Some women I like, some women I don't like, and the vast majority of women I straight up couldn't give a single fuck about. They are nothing but strangers to me, and I would quite literally step over them in the street if I had to. The fact is that I am an individualist and I do judge the individuals in my life on an individual basis. That does not mean, however, that we cannot look at the objective data available and make a cohesive, accurate assessment of large-scale gender demographics. And based on that available data, the female gender appears to represent complete 
abject failure. Their contribution to the sciences has been so fucking feeble that feminists have had to lie and exaggerate the achievements of the very few women they can find to hold up as meagre scientific role models. They have been latecomers to virtually every great leap of exploration we have made as a species, only dipping their toes in the water once men have already swum the channel. Their political endeavours have ranged from the incompetent to the violently disastrous. In a real, physical sense, they have contributed fucking nothing to building and maintaining our modern civilization. Everything from cars to skyscrapers are male creations. Even in the occupational fields that women do overwhelmingly dominate like nursing, the few men who actually enter the field very quickly rise above their lacklustre female colleagues, and the collective female contribution to the arts, philosophy and comedy are much the same worthless or non-existent, which ultimately brings us full circle to the issue of International Women's Day. There is a widespread mistaken assumption that people are automatically entitled to respect. In the particular case of International Women's Day or feminism more broadly, it's the assumption that you should respect women. Well, respect is earned, and that being the case, exactly what have women as a demographic done to earn my respect? I really don't hate women. I mean, I have a hobby interest in understanding the human animal, which is often driven by reproductive biology, but beyond that, I don't particularly care about women one way or the other. In fact, if I'm being frankly honest, I really do not enjoy sitting around for an hour systematically pointing out the collective shortcomings and failures of people. It is a real fucking downer, and the process of making this particular video has actually been a wholly unpleasant experience for me. I don't like doing it. However, if I am going to have International Women's Day rammed down my throat by every government organisation and virtue signalling private enterprise, then I think it's worth asking the question, what are we actually celebrating here? Because from where I'm standing, International Women's Day looks an awful lot like International Abject Failure Day. The comments I made in my last few videos about the parasitic nature of stay-at-home mothers certainly ruffled the feathers of the poor brainwashed trad cucks. But the truth is that whilst stay-at-home mothers represent the most egregious and blatant example of this parasitism, this problem does not simply lie with them, but all women. Based on the numbers, as a collective demographic, all women are effectively social parasites. Women, as a demographic, do not have a symbiotic relationship with the societies in which they live. Consider that in a tiered marginal tax bracket system like we have across most of the Western world, the top 10% of earners are actually paying over 50% of the total income tax revenue. The gender implications of this are huge. The fact that women are working substantially fewer hours in easier, lower paying jobs means that if we look at these graphs showing British income tax brackets by gender, the number of women paying tax in the highest taxable threshold is basically non-existent. This means that the so-called 77 cent pay gap that women like to constantly whinge about actually translates into them paying a whopping 60% less income tax across the board. Forget the supposed 77 cent pay gap, for every dollar that men pay in tax, women are only paying 40 cents. Men are paying almost two and a half times more than women into the Western social system, but who do you think that social system primarily benefits? According to this New Zealand study, over the course of their lives, women on average will consume more societal resources in terms of healthcare, education and direct monetary welfare than what they will ever contribute as tax dollars over the course of their entire lives. Quote, the data illustrated in figure 16 suggests that on average, males start having a positive net fiscal impact i.e. their per capita tax revenue exceeds the allocated government expenditure they receive in their early 20s. Women on average do not pass this break-even point until their mid-40s. This is due to a combination of lower workforce participation, higher health and education spending, higher income support, and lower direct and indirect taxation. 
As can be seen in figure 17, which accumulates across all ages, the positive net fiscal impact women make from 45 to 59 never outweighs the prior negative net fiscal impacts. As a result, when the large negative net impacts of the retirement years arrive, they simply add to an already negative profile. Men, on the other hand, appear to have a positive cumulative net fiscal impact from approximately 40 until 80 years of age. For these particular taxes and public expenditures, the net fiscal incidence on men is approximately zero when accumulated over all ages, end quote. That is a rather cautious, academic, politically correct roundabout way of saying that women are fucking parasites. Collectively, women take far more from society than what they ever contribute over their lives, and it is the working men who are ultimately forced to carry this fiscal burden. This article posted by the Danish business and political magazine Mandag Morgan is a little less roundabout in their assessment. Quote, Almost 40 years after women's entry into the labour market, there remains a surprisingly large difference in how much women and men contribute economically to the welfare state. As the welfare society has collapsed today, women are a deficit business measured throughout their lives, while men pay more to the social fund than they get out of it. A newborn Danish girl will receive more than 1.6 million krone from government in the form of transfers and public welfare benefits than she will contribute through taxes and charges throughout her life. For a newborn boy, it is just the other way round. He will in part contribute 600,000 krone more than he will receive in his life. That is a difference of 2.2 million Danish krone compared to the newborn girl. End quote. Happy International Women's Day, people. A wonderful day where we can celebrate a, quote, deficit business. Fucking fact. Over the course of their lives, the average woman is objectively a net liability on society and men are the ones who have to pay for it. I'm not really an anti-feminist in the broadest definition of the term. I've said it before, but I think it bears reiterating, I want a male birth control pill. I want the same legal rights women have to decide when and if I want to become a father. I want infant genital cutting to be illegal against boys the same as it is illegal against girls. In light of that, I really don't have a great problem with women's liberation per se. I'm glad women have hormonal birth control. I'm glad they have the legal right to abortion. I am glad female genital cutting is illegal. Ultimately, as a man, I wish I had those same rights, but in the absence of those things, I really don't wish to take them away from women. Frankly, I wish them all the best. But to paraphrase the words of Spider-Man, with great liberation comes great responsibility. Times have changed, but women haven't. Over the last hundred years of change, women have not been contributing their fair share back to society in proportion to the new rights and freedoms that society has granted them. Yes, men and women did evolve to fulfill different gender roles, but the environment those different gender roles evolved in doesn't exist anymore. Our ancient ancestors couldn't jump on a plane and travel halfway across the globe in 15 hours. Our ancestors couldn't just walk down to the corner store and buy frozen chicken. Our ancestors couldn't pull their smartphones out and tweet a message to 5,000 people. Welcome to the 21st century. It is time to get with the program or get left behind. I, I really don't care whether you like it or not. The traditional roles of men and women just don't exist anymore and we are never going back to the way things once were. Traditional male roles are now fulfilled by mechanised labour and traditional female roles are now fulfilled by automated white goods. Even in today's military, where women clearly can't meet the same fitness standards of men, though those biological physical disparities are becoming less and less relevant every day, as manned airstrikes have already been replaced wholesale by predator drones and fighter jets are apparently on their way out as well. Something being a traditional gender role just isn't a valid excuse any longer. And whilst men have had to adjust to this changing world and continue to adjust with increased expectation and pressure from mainstream society, women have remained lazy and complacent with their position as the leisure class gender, content to disproportionately indulge in the luxuries of modern society without ever actually contributing their fair share towards its upkeep. 
The only consistent argument I have heard trying to defend this kind of blatant social parasitism is from the tradcuck fraud victims who still have their heads stuck in the 1950s mindset that we need women to make babies and raise children, as if disposable diapers, milk formula, baby monitors, and an assortment of other modern automated white goods hasn't rendered the traditionalist need for a full-time mother completely obsolete in the modern day. I mean, th- these fucking idiots idiots repeatedly claim that stay-at-home mothers have the most important job in the world, as if we don't put that supposedly important responsibility into the hands of 13-year-old babysitters when the mother decides she wants to go out for a night on the town. I mean, ask yourself, in what other profession would that be acceptable? Hello, Mr. Smith, you're about to go in for brain surgery. Now, Dr. Stevens has decided to take the afternoon off, but don't worry because we have 13-year-old Jennifer here to cover his shift. It's a fucking joke. If you can be replaced by an unskilled 13-year-old girl, then what you are doing is not a real job. I mean, Jesus Christ. The way these desperate trad cucks try to justify their own blatant exploitation, you'd think they literally suffer from Stockholm Syndrome. I know you're working 51 hours a week to support the family, but I'm sure your stay-at-home wife works so hard bending over to put the next Disney movie in the DVD player. We need women to make babies and raise children. You know what? Fuck that. It is not a praiseworthy achievement. Rabbits and mice reproduce as well. If you want to be seen as anything more than a fucking rodent, then becoming a Tradcon baby factory that just pops kids out of her bleeding stink hole isn't good enough anymore. It is time for women to actually start pulling their weight in society. People often try to make the argument that I contradict myself when I talk about men being smarter than women, but then expect women to do their fair share in the workforce. Yeah, on average, men are smarter than women, but it is only by a third of a standard deviation or so. That third of a deviation does lead to some big gaps at the end of the bell curve, but there is an awful lot of overlap in that distribution. The fact is that you really don't have to be at the genius end of the bell curve to lay bricks. And as I said earlier, if a mother can physically pick up her four-year-old kid, then there is literally nothing that she can't do on a job site according to OHS regulations. I don't expect an army of female Einsteins, but there is absolutely no good reason to explain why in this day and age, 99% of construction workers are still male, except that women are chronically lazy and the hardworking men that support these fucking leeches, whether through marriage or taxation, are apparently too pussy whipped to call them on it. I stumbled on this article titled, Do Millennial Men and Women Want the Same Things in a Job? The obvious answer is no, but the interesting thing about the survey results covered here are not the same old occupational preferences that we already know about, but rather the top wants in a workplace. Location and career advancement are about the same, but we see some pretty interesting things when we start looking at the areas where men and women do actually differ. Women care more about student loan assistance, women want more flexible hours, they don't want challenging work, they don't want autonomy, and they don't care about the reputation of the company they work for. Most significantly, by a margin of almost 50%, they want a team environment with support and guidance, aka other people around them to pick up their slack. There are absolutely some biological limitations at the high end of sports and mental pursuits, but for the vast majority of us living in the middle of the bell curve, most of the gender differences we see in everyday life are not a direct result of IQ or physical strength, but complacent, lazy, entitled female attitudes. International Women's Day, what are we really celebrating here? You can use force to make people fear you. You can legally mandate that people tolerate you in a workplace. You can even incessantly beg people to pay you more attention than you reasonably deserve. But no matter how hard you try, you cannot force, mandate, or beg people to respect you. In fact, each and every one of those actions is antithetical to developing a reputation worthy of respect. Respect can only be gotten one way, and that is by legitimately earning it. 
I am not anti-woman. What I am is pro-women getting off their fat, lazy, entitled asses for once and actually contributing their fair share back to the societies that they continually take from. To any women listening, when you actually start contributing what men have contributed, then maybe we can talk about celebrating International Equality Day or something. But until that time, you can take all of your International Women's Day nonsense and go fuck yourselves.